Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Daniel Hawkins, who's coming in from Florida, um, and he's a returning guest. We had him on uh, a couple of months ago talking about uh, his series, The Anarchy Never Tried. I think we just talked about part one, and there's a, it's a six-part series, so uh, I'm sure he, there was a lot he did not say. <laughs> so we're going to tease a little bit uh, more information out of him, uh, perhaps part two and part three. And and also, um, he he's associated with Yard Not Being Governed, Facebook pages, uh, also Vacate the Military, Vacate the State, and Vacate Public Schools on Facebook. Um, so the Vacate the Military has been getting um, a little bit bigger recently, so we're, we'll talk about the idea of uh, you know veterans um, coming to anarchy. And you can find all those things, um, all of his uh, uh, writing and information on uh, artofnotbeinggoverned.com. So, uh, Daniel, thanks a lot for coming back on. Uh, sure, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's it a great uh, it's a great chat we had last time, and and I used it frequently when people would uh, you know tell me the common things like, well, it's never been tried, so uh, you know how can this work? <laughs> and I think that's more due to a lack of uh, a lack of uh, information, you know, about the topic, and uh, you know, as as most of them believe that they, you know, since they got their public. Um, education in history in, in, or, or history history education in public school that they think that's all that there is to know about history <laughs> so, yeah pretty much i mean you know that's uh it's unfortunate uh, but um so yeah so get so why don't you uh, go into a little bit of uh you know the um the anarchy never tried so the the part two part three and what you were discussing in those sure um part two is called uh emerald anarchy uh so that one is uh it's part of the Anarchy Never Been Tried series, and that is basically talking about Ireland um, and their long, long tradition of what is called polycentric law. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that term, it's essentially just a legal system um, that is anarchic. And some people might think that those are kind of contradictory, um, having a legal system and living in a stateless society. But actually, having a, a working legal system requires decentralized law. So that means essentially private judges, uh, private um, insurance companies that basically act as lawyers, I guess you could say. Um, and that was the same not only in Ireland, but all around the world. And part three is called Fire and Ice, and that talks about the Somalian uh, legal system called Here Law, and it talks about the I Icelandic legal system. Um, and all three of those are polycentric. Um, what really makes Ireland interesting is that uh, there were at least 2,000 years of this system uh, in perfect, you know, working order as far as anyone knows, uh, maybe longer than that. And Somalia's legal system still exists today in certain parts of Somalia. Um, there's a really good book on it. There's a, I think, a review of the book, I want to say, or at least some information about it on notbeinggoverned.com. And it's called The Law of the Somalis, if you want to check that out. Um, but you can also just read part part three of the uh, series, and I believe there's a link for that in the, the bottom of the article. Cool, yeah. I, um, I've i heard a lot of this stuff from uh, S Stefan Kinsella. Right? He talks a lot yeah. about this, about polycentric law. Have you read any of his uh, works? Only a couple articles here and there. Um, a lot of what I read about it also came from David Friedman. So he's also a great source. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really a fascinating uh, topic because you know it's um, it's I guess like with so many things, we talk about you know legal systems. We always associate that with monopoly on yeah. you know the the monopoly courts and and uh, law enforcement and you know that kind of thing and uh, and you know yeah. So so the state having a monopoly on arbitration, I guess, basically what it says in in your interpretation of man made law, and yeah. and so people kind of are, you know, confused with the idea of, you know, what exactly, how can you have law without the state <laughs> or arbit maybe arbitration without the state? Right. And, uh, and and the idea is that, you know, arbitration, like any service, is um, is something that various people can, can offer and, um, and, you know, can compete with each other, right? Why does it have to be just one provider? 
Right, exactly, exactly right. And it's uh, it's something that, of course, uh, doesn't cross the average person's mind. It didn't cross my mind at all until, you know, a few years ago. So um, I definitely got interested in, in it once I heard about it. And the first time I heard about it was reading uh, Stefan Molyneux's uh, Practical Anarchy, where he talked about uh, DROs, which are dispute resolution organizations. So just kind of looking up, you know, have, have has anything like that ever existed in the past? And the more you research it, you realize, you know, human societies all over Europe, human societies all over Africa, um, parts of Asia and parts of the Americas have always used essentially DROs in one form or another since, you know, since uh, before recorded history. So, Yeah, yeah. And another another interesting idea that, that a lot of people like to give is um, um, if there's no state and you can't coerce people, into, I guess, appearing in, in in an arbitration session like like a court, um, you know, if somebody did commit a crime with a victim, how can you how can you bring them in if they don't want to come in to right. to uh, you know to to see their case? I, and and what would you say to that? I would say um, if you want to know historically how it's been done, um, more or less, I guess, in Iceland is a good example. Um, and Somalia also, so part three, so it's a good thing to read. Uh, people had um, essentially insurance agencies, and this is how it would work, I think, now, um, where if you want the insurance, right, if you want to be represented in court in case something happens to you, right, if you would like someone else to show up, maybe they stole something from you or wronged you in some way. If you want, want them to show up, you get insurance, just like you do for auto insurance, right? Just for getting an accident, you never need it till you need it. So... By signing up, by voluntarily signing that contract, you're saying, I will show up in court if I do something, right? Um, and of course, you can always just not do that. That's the cool thing about a free society is no one's forcing you to sign up, right? There's no social contract. You can not live with that. Um, but I think in those cases, there would be mechanisms uh, involved. If you do sign up, you know, there might be force involved. But with the caveat of you signed up saying, if I don't show up in court, I'm giving these people permission to come and get me. Or, you know, there could be other ways of, can you settle this out of court? Can your insurance companies talk to each other without you needing to personally be involved? Maybe if it's some routine thing, like, you know, a fender bender, you know, it's not like you need to go to court for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would say there's a lot of different options you can take. And of course, uh, you can just settle it person to person. Um, but if someone is really not willing to arbitrate whatsoever, historically there were things like just dissociation, ostracizing, and I think that can work today, definitely. Um, if you don't like a certain company, you can boycott them, and in large enough numbers, boycotts become you know, bankruptcies. It can destroy you, um, and I think that dissociating with people happens today. You hear it with social media people all the time. Um, and historically, the way they did that was a lot of times in Ireland, they would do these things where some people think it's sort of this uh, origin of the hunger strike where another party who refused to show up to court, the wrong party would go to their house and sit on their porch or their steps or whatever and just starve themselves. Hmm. And that's, that's pretty extreme, right? It has to be extreme in that case, I think. Hmm. So they would sit on their porch and say, you know, why am I not eating? Well, it's because this person, you know, this house behind me, this person wronged me and he, you know, or she just doesn't want to come to court. Hmm. So this is what I'm doing. I'm just sitting out here. I'm not aggressing against them. <laughs> I'm just sitting out here and waiting. And of course, they try to get people around the village. And this is the way it works in Somalia. This is the way it worked in Iceland. This is the way it worked in Ireland. They get people around the village to say, you know, they talk to them and say, listen, this person stole something from me or whatever. They're not coming to court. So I'd really appreciate it if you just stop doing business with them. Don't sell them anything. Don't feed them. Don't let them into your house. Don't let them borrow anything, whatever. It's all reputation, right? And that's why I think a lot of old societies really emphasized honor because your word was your bond, right, before contract law. But even today, you can use Bitcoin, right? You can use the uh, blockchain to ensure those types of things, and those are self-actuating contracts. So if you don't want to show up to court, it's no problem. You have a self-actuating contract already yeah 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 it's a good point um 
uh that yeah you're right like in in these uh you know old older societies my my wife likes to tell me that you know like she she likes to watch these um you know these movies of uh how they were in victorian england you know and and uh, britain and things like that and and you know in, in europe as well you know with uh, you know chivalry and, and the knights and uh, you know <laughs> and uh being honorable right and yeah and being you know one of the the, the worst uh the, the the worst um punishments is to be considered or is to be dishonored or or or, oh, yeah. or act dishonorably and uh, and that's amazing how that's changed and and it's no longer the case and maybe i i would argue also that the um um uh, you know that welfare and the war on poverty has done a lot to destroy the um the need for people to retain reputation a good reputation yeah. in society because who cares if you take care of you know or, or if you treat your neighbors nicely or kindly because you're gonna, you know, if you if you fall on bad, you know, or or hardship, you can just just apply to the state <laughs> to to help right. you out, right? Of course, yeah, um, and of course, I mean, there's always the chance that without that, someone might fall through the cracks. You know, maybe they were framed or something, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always that possibility. But then, you know, there's still charity and that sort of thing, and that did exist in uh, early medieval Europe. I know for a fact, uh, there were organizations, especially churches. Um, there's a reason why churches offered sanctuary to criminals, right? Because it didn't matter if the church knew they were guilty or not. Mm -hmm. They would take them in all the same. But I would say that the state, especially being a monopolistic organization that does handle arbitration at the same time, mm -hmm. definitely has eroded that sense of responsibility, personal responsibility. You know, um, because a community would be around even in that sense to say, you really should turn yourself in or whatever. Or if this person has wronged you, you know, we'll help you. Mm -hmm. You just need to provide the proof right? Or help us, you know, make that case. So personal responsibility was essential to a human life. If you didn't have it, you couldn't survive. You couldn't feed yourself. No one would do business with you, you know, because especially um, in a barter system like that, that existed a long time ago, you know, if you let someone borrow something, like a plow or something, you were doing it with the expectation that that person was going to give it back to you as you gave it to them, right? Mm. Um, and of course, I think we're getting back to that a little bit with Bitcoin, and with uh, with cryptocurrencies, I think we're kind of restoring that sense of personal responsibility that uh, we've kind of lost over time. Yeah, yeah. One thing that's interesting about Bitcoin is that it's a, like pseudo anonymity, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, in one sense, I, I could see how uh, some people could say, "Well, maybe um, the idea of Bitcoin is kind of um, um, you know undermining." The necessity to have a good reputation because you know you, you can't how do you boycott somebody who you don't even know who you're interacting or you're exchanging with you know you're right. <laughs> you, you know you don't even know the other person so so in that in that idea in that cyber world how do you boycott somebody Wait, what would you say to that well i would say that um if you're trying to make a living on your own especially it's good to have your identity out there in some way mm -hmm. Um, maybe not at the moment, you know, maybe not if, you know, depends on what you're selling and how you're selling it. Um, and I'll just leave that there. But if you were maybe on, you know, a site like Etsy, right? Um, if you want to sell some of your art or whatever, you know, some craft that you make, putting your, yourself out there in kind of this, as, as this, you know, person who, who has a business, uh, really helps, you know, and people can, uh, tell by your reputation whether they want to buy something from you. Mm. And I mean, the same, it's the same way that it works on eBay. It's the same way that it works on Amazon, you know. And I think that things like Yelp today could be completely compatible with Bitcoin for sure. But I think we're becoming actually more aware of people's reputation now because we have the Internet, right? You can find out who someone is pretty easily. Right, Google. <laughs> you right. Google somebody. <laughs> and I mean, that could be a bad thing, of course, but right. I think it really could be a good thing. I think that ultimately putting out your personality... Uh, at least, you know, in a professional sense is a really good thing to do. It's just smart, mm. you know, to say, this is me, this is what I make, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and and it helps with, with your business because it shows that you're an honest person willing to put yourself out there in that way. And having people give you reviews, you know, write reviews for you is a good thing mm -hmm. to say. And, and, you know, just let it happen. If someone gives you a bad review, well, that's how you fix yourself. That's how you make more money. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, I mean, the whole contract uh, element that can come with the blockchain is definitely something that I think we've lost. Uh, private contracting uh, is not really something that happens. Like truly private contracts 
don't really happen in a monopolistic society. Hmm. You know, um, the government handles a lot of contracts, and we've noticed over time it happened. This goes back all the way to the Norman Conquest. I know in English law, um, where civil offenses became criminal offenses. We've turned civil crimes into criminal, you know, or civil cases into criminal cases, and it just kept increasing. It just kept it kept on increasing and increasing and increasing, um, to where today, um, lawsuits, you know, a lot of times are handled criminally. Whereas I, I mean, with Bitcoin, I think uh, if someone isn't satisfied with the deal or something, that self-actuating contract can make it so you can get your money back much more easily than you can going through a, a government court and then it's years of litigation and <laughs> lawyer fees and all right. that. <laughs> right. Right. And and I don't I don't remember uh I think it was Stefan Kinsella he's he's he mentioned this that the idea that um you know like like today um you know let's say a, a big corporation let's say like Monsanto can you know um sabotage a small farm and like, you know, with the intent of destroying them financially, you know, like, let's say, sprinkle some of their seeds on their on their, um, you know, their uh, their land and then and then claim that they, they stole them. And then you engage these people in, in months or years of of, uh, you know, litigation that bankrupts them because they they have these like, you know, army of <laughs> lawyers and yeah. never, you know, bottomless pockets. So so and Stefan Kinsella was saying, like, if if in the end something like um, if. If uh, the person um, who who made the charge, you know, was found to be, um, you know, the, the, or the person that was charged were, was found innocent, then 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 the person who made the charge has to pay all those fees, yeah. And, right? Yeah, and that is actually the way that it worked until pretty recently. Actually, all the way up until well past Elizabethan times, I know in England, is that if someone falsely accused someone right. and the court finds out. That it was malicious, mm. you know. Not all fa false accusations are malicious, mm. but um, some of them were. The way that that would have been handled in the ancient world and in a lot of the early medieval world would be through uh, combat. <laughs> we don't want to do that today, of course. <laughs> um, and there are so many other ways we can handle that right. instead, you know. Uh, especially financially, now that we have a much better uh, monetary system, you know. Mm. But uh, that will damage your reputation for sure. And it used to be that if, if someone did accuse someone falsely, knowing that they were innocent, they would have to pay the equal amount. In English law, it was paying the equal amount that that person would have had to pay you. Right. So if you accuse someone of murder, which was like you know pretty terrible, knowing that that person was innocent, you would have to pay whatever bounty would have been ordered you know, had that person actually committed the murder mm -hmm. on top of everything else, on top of paying for your, you know, for your um, basically lawyer or whatever mm -hmm. um, and taking the case to the judge uh, who would usually ask for the same price from both parties. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just a stupid thing to do. It was then and it is now and it still would be without the government involved. I, I just thought of this now. Um, like what about, it, you know, because you see this happening recently a lot with, um, you know, really... Um, I, I guess famous men like celebrities and mm -hmm. and then these women come up from the woodworks like from their distant past saying he raped me decades ago now yeah. now you know regardless if they can prove it or not like that's a serious yeah. attack and and that's a that's a uh you know that injures their reputation seriously right oh, for sure so yeah. how do you recover like how would they recover that you know <laughs> i'm just curious do you have an idea what, what do you think um, in a polycentric system, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously statutes of limitations are by themselves monopolistic, I think. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that private, um, insurance agencies would probably negotiate a type of statute of limitation. Um, and of course with rape, I mean, it's not like murder where, I mean, it's not quite the same where there is no statute of limitations for murder in almost any country. Right. But for that, I mean, I guess it depends on the society at the time. It depends on what people are demanding. You know, that's mm -hmm. in a market for justice. They would be, of course, having to listen to what people believe is right. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, the majority of the populace or some part of the populace thinks that their the statute of limitations should be 10 years or something, mm -hmm. barring this case, this case, this case, and this case, 
insurance agencies will listen to that and will have to in order to survive, in order to keep their customers, have policies that say, in this case, this case, this case, and this case, within a period of 10 years, you can bring your case, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing about it, is that whatever situation you can come up with, there's always some portion of the market that believes a certain thing, and polycentric law has always been a response to customary beliefs and customary opinions, and that's something that David Friedman definitely writes a lot about, is that... Mm -hmm. These, uh, whether it was you know a tribal society or it's our modern society today, whatever our beliefs are, would be reflected not only in the marketplace for goods and services, but in the marketplace for justice. So whatever we think is right and wrong has to be reflected that way. Otherwise, those companies go out of business. The government can tell you what's right and wrong, and they don't care because you're their slave. You have to do whatever they tell you. Mm. But in a in a system where you pay them, where you pay your insurance company they have to come up with these things for you. And like today with auto insurance, now they have good driving rewards and that sort of thing, right? Those are things that are kind of newer policies but that people have been demanding. And of course, there's nothing that says insurance companies that handle uh, cases against others, you know, that today you would be handled in a government court wouldn't have to, you know, it's nothing that says they wouldn't have to listen to you in the same way that your auto insurance company does. So, so the term statute of limitation it, um, when, means um, that there's a certain time limit where somebody can make an accusation from when it right. when when they accuse. Okay, so like like you can't accuse somebody of like in like harming your great your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, right. And you can't be like this person stole my TV twenty years ago because at that point it's like, do you, why did you suddenly care? Right. So <laughs> of course, right. a court today you can convince. You know, well, they, I suddenly care because of this reason, but they might not listen to you. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a private in a in a private arbitration setting, and with your own insurance company, or uh, or between two insurance companies, they can come to agreements case by case. And I think that's really important. That's a really important distinction to make. Is that with a monopolistic legal system, there is no case by case. It's one size fits all. That's mm -hmm. what monopolistic law is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, I could talk about this for a long. This is a fascinating topic to me. Yeah. Um, but also, actually, let, let me say one more thing before we talk about the uh, the vacated military. Um, sure. It's like you mentioned. Um, I think it, Etsy, and you know the idea that so many people say, well, you know, if there wasn't a government looking out for us, you know, we we would be buying products that would be killing us. We'd be buying food that would be poisoning us. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, without the FDA, without USDA. And so, and then I'm like, well, haven't you heard of like Amazon reviews and <laughs> consumer right. consumer reports and <laughs> right? And it's not and it's not like you know those companies that have been poisoning people. Waste management, right? Yeah. Big case in uh, Alabama. They were poisoning people because they had this landfill that they put next to a small town. Mm -hmm. Poisoned a lot of people, but waste management had enough lawyers and enough friends in the government, like the uh, DA of Alabama was involved with waste management, you have no, like, you have no avenue of redress for that because it's you against the same party. We talk about judge, the term judge, jury, and executioner. You know, who are you to be judge, jury, and executioner? Mm. Rightly so, right? That's an outrage. But suddenly when it's the government, we don't think of it being the single entity being judge, jury, and executioner, mm -hmm. you know, but that's what it is. It's the government is, it handles all of it. It handles the police, it handles writing the laws, and it handles arbitrating. Right. <laughs> so We find ourselves not guilty. <laughs> right. We found ourselves not guilty. And that's exactly what happens. Right. And of course, you know, with like Etsy or something like that, you can be like, okay, don't buy from this person. Yeah. And you can tell your friends, don't buy from them. Yeah. And their business will probably just shrivel up and die. And it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you know, talking about judge, jury, and execution, I, I, I use that term a lot just describing police <laughs> law enforcement like it, yeah. it's, it's just so, so sad how uh, like a lawyer can go to can go to um you know go to university for years and years and you know yeah. have a have a case of let's say murder and that goes on for such a long time and then you got you got you know, right. this cop just shooting people without you know without uh, repercussions right. or punishment and even even the prosecutors in a lot of those cases are completely paid off and completely right 
you know, are, don't actually want to prosecute it. I think like 1% of, of officer-involved shootings actually end up in an indictment, let alone a conviction. <laughs> I can't imagine wow. what tiny number the conviction must be. Yes. You know? <laughs> right, paid vacation, right? Yeah, uh, paid vacation. <laughs> so, and then you're probably done, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, all right, so, so why don't we uh, yeah, talk about your uh, Vacate the Military, and you said it's been growing recently, right? Uh, yeah, we just hit 5,000 likes. Um, I've been like kind of involved in the peripheries mostly, but it's been a whole host of people um, who some of them don't want their names to be shared for obvious reasons because vacate the military, especially mm. especially out of almost all our pages, gets the most death threats. Right? Wow! This is something that happens. This is something that happens on Facebook mm. all the time. Mm. Grown adults, grown adults, said I assume sending messages <laughs> to people right. saying, you know, I'm going to go to your house and kill you in your sleep. Wow. I mean, these are people who think that they are somehow uh, sane and uh, right. integral to a peaceful society and, uh, you know, law and order. Um, yeah. So, the, no, this is, it's, it's, I think, because of that, I think, is, is why we're so proud of it. Um, and it's one of the sister pages of Art of Not Being Governed. Um, but it's something that uh, Jamie Redman helped uh, kind of start. Um, he does almost all the graphics. And I think it's it's been it's been a really huge success recently, um, and we've had we have one admin who is a uh, veteran, at least one admin who's a veteran, and he's been handling a lot of the messages that we get. A lot of them are from other veterans saying like, you know, sometimes they're like, I think you're really wrong about this, but I'm willing to talk to you. And some of them are like, man, I've been thinking this over, and maybe maybe you know, being in the military was a mistake, and I've been thinking about this, and I just want to know what you think. Or, you know, things like that. And honestly, it's surprising for the amount of death threats that we do get, for the amount of negative messages that we do get. Hmm. There are a lot of people that are like, man, you're really helping me rethink all of this, you know? Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, on the, on the Seeds of Liberty podcast, um, we had uh, these two guys um, doing the podcast called Force to Freedom. And they were both, um, you know, um, anarchist volunteer sex uh, military guys. And, uh, uh, Donnie Gebert was one of them. He was an awesome guy because uh, he's, uh, he, you know, he was outlining, you know, explaining why it's so important to reach, um, you know, people in the military. Because he's like, if you if you can get the people in the military on your side, it's right. like those guys are like switchblades. <laughs> They're like useful <laughs> in difficult situations, and they have skills. And uh, and if you can just, you know get them to understand these things it's right. amazing how much of a of an asset they can be of course and that's been actually um if you and i think uh prof cj talks about this um some of his podcasts awesome guy. Yeah, the history of <laughs> oh yeah definitely i haven't talked to him yet but i really have to uh but the history of revolutions you know you always hear about these revolutions like in spain right, right. the the civil war uh in, in italy but even before then french revolution there's always been these uh the revolutionary elements always try to get military people on their side, right? France had Napoleon and also uh, Lafayette on their side, and it helped them succeed. And, of course, they're always looking for veterans, especially in Italy and Spain. When they fought the fascists, they were looking for veterans um, on their side. And those, of course, were actual wars, but even if it doesn't amount to that, they're still good people to have. And, of course, those revolutions were fighting for the wrong causes, etc., mm. you know, putting their own people in charge. But it was still a smart thing to do. And even right now, the, the military is full of, you know, very, very statist elements, usually conservative. And those are the people that need it the most, right? Uh, we don't want to preach to the choir, you know. We, it's nice, you know, <laughs> it's really nice. I like having these conversations, of course, but these the conversations we're having aren't for us. They're for mm -hmm. people who haven't heard them yet. Right. And I think that Vacate the Military especially is a huge, uh, you know, help with that. Mm. If you can find one veteran who's willing to talk to his friends, mm -hmm. you know, even if he gets shut down nine times out of ten, that one time out of ten makes a whole lot of difference because mm. that can just lead to more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One thing that he said that, like, that stuck with me was, um, you know, the, the brain, you know, when you talk to people in general, I guess, um, the brain is like, um, think of a man on an elephant, and the man is the intellect, the rational part of your mind the elephant is the emotional reptilian yeah. limbic system part of your mind and so you can talk to the intellect all you want 
talk to the man. He can understand everything you're saying. <laughs> but if the elephant doesn't like you, he's going wherever he's going to go, and the man is going to go with him. <laughs> That's true, yeah. And I think one of the main things that really turned me toward libertarianism and turned me ultimately toward uh, volunteerism uh, was reading about uh, the drone war. Mm. And that was definitely something that I you know, thought and felt about at the same time, which I think is what you really need. Mm. Um, just hearing about like, there's, a, there's another study that confirmed this, actually, a really comprehensive study. But the first one I read was that in Pakistan over the course of like, you know, six years or something, 98% of the casualties were uh, non, were the non-valued, tar- like non-high-value targets. So only 2% were high-value targets. The rest were just unknown. Oh, shoot. Right. Yeah. So by the rules of war, you have to assume those are civilians. Right. Of course, you know, the U.S. government doesn't do that. But we're not even supposed to legally you know, by our own laws, by international laws, have a presence in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. So how do you have how do you have that many casualties and that such a dismal rate of, you know, mm-hmm. of success, two percent mm-hmm. if you're not even supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. And of course a lot of these are kids. Yeah. You know? Um but of course, you know, a lot of people will just say that's collateral damage. Right. But that's something that definitely got my you know, got my head in it and my feelings in it. Um, that was something that I started researching more about and just the war, you know, wars in general, like the Iraq war. Um, but it's something that I think helps a lot of people kind of come toward us, you know, is that it's an ethical thing. It's a, it's an emotional thing seeing that your tax money is going toward these, you know, going toward the department of defense and going toward their contractors Mm -hmm. who in turn are just indiscriminately killing women and children. Mm -hmm. That's happening all the time. Yeah. Uh, there's a really good app. I can't remember what it's called, but you can get up to date, uh, pretty much up to the minute, drone really? bomb like <laughs> updates. Wow. Yeah. Oh my god. And it's like you know really grisly. They don't actually say any details. Gosh. Um. No, it's called metadata. That's what the app is called. It's called metadata. Hmm. It has the uh, the logo is the um, is one of the NSA's little logos they had on. Uh, that's the octopus with the tentacles all over the earth. Wow. Yeah. You know yeah, yeah, that yeah. people were talking about how uh, it's just the creepiest logo. Right. But but it does somehow it gets the metadata of the drone strikes. Um, no one knows how. Oh shoot. <laughs> how they get it, but they do get it, and so they'll say you get an update that says like another drone strike in Yemen killed, uh, hit a car, seven people dead. Mm. Right. It doesn't say who they are unless they know it's a kid or something. Yeah. But it's just something that really be like, and especially if you see pictures and stuff, you're like, man, that's what's happening. Oh, that, right. It has pictures too? It doesn't have pictures, but if you do, you know, there are articles and stuff you can oh, read, right. you know, like uh, antiwar.com and stuff. Right, right. Sometimes there are pictures and they're like, that for me especially was like, right. and, and seeing the Iraq war too, seeing a lot of that, like the highway of death, um, you know, it hits home because you're like, this is the evil of government. And, and the same goes for the other side too. Same goes for other governments murdering people, you know whether it was Stalin, Pol Pot, whatever. Um, yeah, that, that reminds me of, uh, you know, I, I know you have to go, but <laughs> it reminds me of Carl Hess' uh, quote, um, you know, if you're a government apologist, or, or no, if you're a government supporter, you're, sooner or later you're going to have to be an apologist for mass murder. Yeah, and, all the time. Yeah. I people, mean, in his, in history, it's, it's, it's the name of the game is mass murder. Right. Yeah, and, and a lot of people, it's amazing how many people gloss over that. You know, it's like, well, we got roads. That's yeah. nice. You know, we what got, if, we got, <laughs> right. Well, what I've noticed is if you talk to historians, especially, or people who are familiar with political science, right. is at some point in the conversation, they will tell you straight face and completely sober, yeah, the foundation of government is violence. Right. Barack Obama said it in an interview, oh, right? Yeah. Monopoly on violence. He said, yeah. uh, the go- government is a monopoly on violence, and mm-hmm. that's what we have. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's what it is. That's and they'll they'll tell you that with a straight face because uh, for some reason they have like this perverse sense of like uh, that's what's right. That's what we need mm. because otherwise it would be more violence, more decentralized violence. So what we should do is just centralize all the violence. So that way we just have one really super powerful warlord <laughs> who you can't escape. <laughs> you know there is no escape. Rather than having some, you could possibly escape. So I don't know why they get, they get to that conclusion, but a lot of them do. A lot of professors, a lot of writers will get right. to that conclusion and say, "Yeah, government is violence. It always has been violence." Right. But it's like it's something we need, right? It's really it's you know for the common security, even though there is no security because mm. there's nowhere to go. There's there's no exit, right? You're right. always on their plantation, on the state's plantation, right. whether you're 
on this plot of land or on the other one across mm-hmm. the border, right? Mm-hmm. It's still you're still inside like just a really big prison. Right, um, definitely. So, and and I mean like over history, I'm sorry, um, no, but over sure. over history, there's always been like you know t- t- people of uh, these great men. You know, uh, Alexander the Great and stuff was just really awesome at killing people. <laughs> the Great, yeah, right? I know, I like the, those names. <laughs> and we talk about these people who are just, just really fantastic at killing a lot of people. And that's what it's always been about. It's how you expand your empire. You don't expand your empire by being friendly, right? And of course, <laughs> historians, especially the English historians, write about this and they do it with this sense of like, you know, it was, it's not great, but it, but just look at that and look at these accomplishments. And, right. you no, know, really, we, we, it's, it's kind of admirable, right, that whatever person happened to be, like, the best killer or the best at telling other people how to kill other people, right? You know, generals, that's what they do is they just tell other people the best way to kill a lot of people at once. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, that's culminated with the atom bomb. So sooner or later... It's kind of a law of diminishing returns. Mm. You know, you can only kill so many people before it starts to affect you. But, of course, that's why we have drones. You know, you just get really good at it. That damn, damn conscience creeping up on you. But yeah, we're always, we're always looking for writers. We're always looking for readers. Um, and definitely check out on Facebook, Vacate the Military, Vacate the State, Vacate Public Education. You know, uh, always really great material, and we're always looking for help, too, so... Awesome, awesome. So if anybody wants to uh, help out my show, please do so. Um, uh, you can do so at uh, bi- uh, through bi- Bitcoin or PayPal um, and also through Patreon, patreon.com slash Peaceful Anarchism. Um, help us out. I'd love to do this and interview wonderful people like Daniel here. And I want to continue doing it. Uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated, right? We are capitalists, as you said. And uh, if you find value in this content, please help me out. You know, a dollar per show is fine. Whatever you can... Uh, Whatever you can spare, whatever you believe it, it, it value it is to you, uh, I, I am most appreciative. Uh, if any comments on the shows, you know, you can uh, uh, e- leave me an email, Danilo Kipu at yahoo.com. Danilo uh, Kipu, K I P U, at yahoo.com. So uh, thank you, um, thank you uh, uh, Daniel, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. So this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.